Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Fargo Youth Initiative, we are so excited to have you at Impact Fargo 2019. Your decision to attend today's conference shows a dedication to improving Fargo and celebrating the power of youth. Please help me in welcoming Mayor Tim Mahoney for a few opening remarks. That was quick. I thought you were going to tell a long story about me. Good morning. So we're going to talk about a couple things here this morning. Do you know that you make up 25% of the population of Fargo? No, not in this room. <laughs> Good response. People under 18 make up about 25% of the community. You know, one of the things we like to do is about uh, in the 90s, Governor Hoven came out one day and said, we ought to increase the population of North Dakota and we ought to increase the jobs. So they increased the jobs and they tried to increase the population. We were down to about 625,000 people in the state and we were going this way. So they said, gee, if we get jobs, maybe people stay in the state, which that did happen. We have 5,000 jobs available in Fargo right now that anybody could work at if they wanted to. And what happens is, is that we don't always get those people to do that. If uh, you would attend NDSU, about 84% of the people that attend NDSU stay here if they're in state. If they're out of state, only about 35%. Now we're trying to grow to 1 million in the state of North Dakota in the next 10 years. Do you think we can do it? You guys are gonna have a lot of babies, things turn out or what? How you build that population is a question right now, and uh, President Trump says right now, North United States is full, right? We're full, we don't need any more people, right? And we do need people, right? We need diversity, we need changes in our community. We used to take 550 refugees a year into the in city of Fargo. We're down to about 180 right now because immigration has slowed down, people aren't allowing people in. But shouldn't we be a country that embraces people and have them come into our community? Don't they offer a lot of different diversity and help us out a little bit? So one of the challenges you have, how would we do that? How would we make people feel welcome? You know, if you come in and sit down and sit in the corner, does somebody come over and say hi to them? Say, who are you? Where are you from? What you're doing? So the idea is, is how do we make people who come into our community feel welcome, not bullied, not pushed aside, not, not part of the clique? And it's a real challenge right now because in our country, a lot of people are feeling a little isolated, not part of the group. So that's really important that what you work on today, whatever you can do to make Fargo more welcoming, I would really appreciate. Now, what we did the city hall, as we did art in the hall and we we wanted if you went to old city hall it was just functional kind of a functional old office building uh, really dark not really a lot of stuff you could do at it's, and in this uh, hall what we tried to do is you'll see the art panels on all the sides those lights can change when the prints died we could have changed them purple you know you can do different things to kind of go with the theme of what's going on at the time and they have little parts of what part of fargo has or has to offer to the community. Also, you'll see throughout the area of City Hall, we have art all over. We don't have a lot of youth art, which is what I'd like to have is, can we have some art? I have a young lady who was in eighth grade, gave me a beautiful picture that she painted herself. But we don't get a lot of that in the, in the area and we'd like to change the art up on and off, do different things, are there things we can do to do that? We think art helps the community. The question is, should we put some public art as well? So when you're downtown Fargo, if you go downtown Sioux Falls or Rapid City, you'll see statues of people in that city. You know, what do we want in our city to show it off, right? You go to Pelican Rapids, they have all these pelicans around all the time that's in the city. We used to have all sorts of buffaloes. I wonder why, bison, right? But um, so you can have a variety of things, a variety of themes, but what, how do you think we can enhance and make it better? I did see one of the comments, somebody said, make mountains. I don't think we can make mountains here, right? We're trying block nine is going to be 18 stories, so that's the best we'll do for a mountain. But how do we make the downtown? It's kind of cool for adults, but how can it be cool for the youth? I mean, is there something else we could have down there that doesn't involve drinking, that can involve an area get together? Outside here, you see a big parking lot. What would you like to see there? We have a vision of putting a big uh, green plaza there, a green space, a big lawn a big area that has that. Maybe we'll put a water feature in it because we all like to like water flow, right? Not flood, 
but the flow, right? Maybe you put a little water feature in. Maybe you make a gathering space. So maybe it's a place where young people come together and gather. We have somebody in the community that wants to do a peace garden. So they want to do an area that's peaceful that you can sit and it has multiple different sayings about peace, just different ways. You know, you have the peace garden in northern North Dakota, but it's kind of hard to get up there, right? It'd be easier to do something in Fargo, right? So there's a variety of ways you can do that or impact or try to make a statement for the community. What is it that we stand for? The plaza isn't quite built. It's going to cost about $6 million, <clears throat> and I don't quite have that. I'm hoping we'll take a collection here today and get $5 million, but I think that'll turn out. No? No. Okay. You guys got it? Okay. Um, you know, so we got to do the plaza, and the plaza will be something that is work in progress. We're still taking in input on that. So if there's things you'd like to see in that, uh, could you show a movie? Could you have a concert? Could you have yoga? Could you have different things in that plaza? How much green space do you have? Have any of you traveled to Boston? Any Boston goers here? So I went out in school in Boston, and when they had their city hall, what they have is a huge three-block area that's all brick. It's all hard brick. That's their plaza. So when people gather, they come onto this brick space. And it's a nice space. It's I mean, you know, right downtown in Boston, but brick? I don't think that would be very friendly. If you can do a plaza, you can have grass. You can have grass in walking spaces. You can have grass very little grass and all hard surfaces. So trying to think what you'd like or what you think would be kind of neat to have. You can have a little topography, which means city hall is high. You got to go that squirrely sidewalk to get up here right now. All that will be the same level eventually with 2nd Street. So how about we go down 2nd Street to downtown? How about we take that street and make that brick and make that an area where people have vendors and different people come out and sell things like the farmer's market, but they have it during the week and have things that are going on there. So there's a variety of things you could do out to the downtown. We know what Broadway is, but what if you come off Broadway and do something else? The other thing is, what are we going to do with the river? You know, at flooding now, we don't really have a lot of fun when it floods, but can we activate the river? Can we make kayaks? Can we make canoes? Can you go down to the river and do things? Can you make a park? Can we make the bike path safe, right? If you're in a bike path, you really don't want to be threatened when you're in a bike path. What is it you can do with that? Can we throw some art in there that we drive around town and try to figure out all the different artist things that we have throughout the community? Um, you see by the bridge, Veterans Bridge, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but that's a beautiful bridge. It's got all these things that are dedicated to our vets throughout the country. But it's one of the prettiest bridges you'll ever see. And there's a Statue of Liberty right next to it, which you never would really think, why do we have a Statue of Liberty in Fargo? But we do. And those are kind of those hidden art things you don't know anything about. The other question I got asked is, how did I get into politics? How many of you want to get into politics here? You can all raise your hand. Couple? <laughs> okay, so you may not want to get into politics itself, but if you could get involved, that's really a big thing to do. If you could get involved in our community, that really helps. Because oftentimes as mayor, what I lead for is a silent majority. People don't really say much to me or tell me much, but I, I got to kind of be going the direction I think they want to go. For the young people, are we headed the right direction or should we turn a little bit or go different ways. And that's the hardest thing as a leader. You don't always know what people want. I sometimes know what people don't want because I have a vocal minority where people say, oh, we don't want this, we don't want that, we don't want this, we don't want that. And you almost want to say, well, what do you want then? You know, I can hear what all you don't want, but what do you want for our community? So sometimes what you need to do is think about what is it that you think would be impactful to our community? We have 850 people that are homeless every night. We haven't dented that in 10 years. I keep having homeless people throughout the community. What would we do about that? How can we make that better? Is there ways people can get uh, affordable housing? Are there other things we can do to help? So a lot of those issues are how, how do we address how we live in our community and how do we care for each other? Because we'll be judged by how we care for the people that don't have as much versus judged by how you just take care of yourself. So oftentimes that's a really a challenge for you to do. When I first ran for mayor, I had a, what I call a two-minute drill, and I want you guys to think about this. If I asked you in two minutes to describe yourself, could you do that? Could you go in two minutes and say, this is what I want, and this is what I believe in, this is what I'm about? Because it's kind of hard to get it down to two minutes, because you'd be introduced, you'd say, this is Tim Mahoney, he's running for mayor. Hey, Tim, why are you running? And so what you found is, it's critical in your two minutes to think about what impacts people, right? But they kind of want to know, okay, what would I tell? 
I tell them a story about, or should I do that? You know, you want to say something that people can gather and say, oh, I, I think that's okay. And my theme was just as that. I was new into politics. I just wanted to get involved, see what it's about. And I thought that I could listen to people. Like my theme was a leader who listens. And then maybe I could accomplish some things for the people that they wanted. And it was always interesting because the guy I ran against said I was on Park Board, I was on uh, Qantas, I was this, I was that. He had been multiple service clubs and a lot. And you go, oh God, that guy's going to beat me because he does so much service. And what you found out, what people eventually get into is they try to figure out you and what is it about you that makes you want to lead. So when you raise your hand and say you want to get into politics, that's part of what it is. What, why do you want to lead or what do you want to do? And then people can kind of get into believing you. And I think it's just like the Democrats right now. Which candidate would you support right now for president in the Democratic field? They've got like 20 people running. And how is it that somebody's going to gather the imagination of that the population and become the front runner? I mean, that's a tremendous challenge. And it's no different than yourselves. If you try to do something and convince this group, hey, we're all going to do this now, it takes a lot of courage and takes a lot of force to kind of get people to go the direction you want to go. So what happens today is what I call exploration. What you're going to explore is just what are the different things that we can do to make Fargo a place people want to stay? What is it in your experiences that you think can change or be better that would make some people say, hey, it's kind of a cool city? And I remember in the days when Fargo wasn't such a cool city, about 20 years ago, downtown Fargo was a ghost town. There was hardly anything going on. All the store shops were done. It just it looked like really a bad place to be. And then what happened is NDSU moved part of its campus downtown. You know what happened? We got youth infused. So we had activity. What happens when you get activity? You get people. It feels safe, right? How many of you cruise Broadway? Anybody drive on cruise? Kind of cruise Broadway, right? Not a lot of places to go if you don't drink. There's a pizza joint. There's a couple of places you can go, right? But we've been cruising Broadway for all the time Broadway has existed. What we've got to do is make activities. So what would we add to activities downtown so you didn't necessarily have to only cruise, but maybe we could stop and do something, right? Or we can gather. Or we can do something where people get together and do things together. So think about that when you're doing things today. The other thing we want you to think about, if we put public art in, where would we put it? Do you want it inside, outside? Do you want it stuff you can climb on? Do you want it like big stuff, little stuff? What type of things would you think would be kind of cool to have? You know, it's the panels that we have around the building outside. You'll see those panels. Those can change. So you could change those, change them up and do something different. You could have pictures of youth. I recently was giving a lecture about the 209 flood. And the crowd was impressed because we have 120,000 people live in Fargo, and we had 100,000 volunteers for that flood. And most of them were young people. It was our high school kids and our college kids that saved us in 209. And the reason is, you guys have a lot of energy, right? Well, maybe not right now, but normally we have a lot of energy, right? And what happened is that whenever we had trouble with the sandbag and the old timers getting tired, you just bring a group of youth in, young people, and they made everybody feel happier and we got the sandbagging done. But uh, it was at that time, sandbags that we made would could be built into the same thing as the Empire State Building. So we made as many state sandbags that would make a, a facsimile of the Empire State Building. So that's a lot of sandbags. But it's really because of the youth that helped us out. So if you said there was a hero in the flood fight of 209, it was Denny Wallacher who was the previous mayor and was our volunteers. So over 100,000 volunteers. And when you say that, I was out east and they said, oh, we'd never get that out here. People wouldn't come. That means people cared and people loved the city. So that's can, what can happen as well. So the third item I'd like you to think about is just are there any problems that you see in our community that you think you'd like to look at or fix or give me a suggestion? I love suggestions because usually it morphs into something. Right now we're trying to get millennials have a hard time getting into homes because they have student debt, right? So we're trying to figure out how can we get that bridge to get people into homes. So our planning department is looking at different modules, different ways of doing that. But that's our challenge when people are about 30, how do they stay here, buy a home, and, and stay in the community? Or do you want a home? Are, are you going to be a generation that lives in apartments? 60% of the population in Fargo lives in apartments. About, uh, our average age is about 33. So it's a young population, right? We have two bubbles. We have your bubble, the youth, and we have a bubble of people that retire and come into the community. 
So obviously they have two different issues that go along in those areas. But we will uh, rely a lot on what people think to make the community better. We're on what I call riding the crest. Things are getting better and better. We're the top growing city since uh, for 10 years in the Midwest. It's one of the top growing cities in the Midwest. And we have multiple different awards that we'll get. Best place to start a business, best place for millennials to live because of wage and cost of living. And so we have many things that are, you, you know, you would like, but what other things can you do to make it better? So I'll leave that as your challenge today and I'll look forward to your ideas. I'm not gonna make a mountain, but <laughs> I could open. Do you, anybody have any questions? Want anything about Fargo? You know most of about it, right? Seven times national champions, NDSU, right? We have a commission form of government, I will tell you that. We have five people on the commission. You have four commissioners and one mayor. So in order to get any of your initiatives done, what do I have to do? I have to get three votes. So sometimes when you look at that, you have to figure out which commissioner will vote my way. It's an interesting way of government. The other thing Fargo is going to have, which it's never had before, is approval voting. That no place in the country does that. On our next vote, we're going to do approval voting. So on approving voting, approval voting, you can have seven candidates, and you can say, I like four of them, but I don't like three of them. You can vote for the four, and whoever gets the most votes will win the election. So it's an interesting way of doing it. We've never done it before, before we tried to get a majority vote. But this will be kind of an interesting election next one, so watch it in uh, 20 is when we'll have that first time to see. And you'll be able to vote, so if you're here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, do we have our next speaker? Let's give another round of applause for Mayor Mahoney. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so before we get started with our wonderful speakers today, uh, we'd like to introduce you guys a little bit more about what FYI is, what Impact Fargo is, um, who we are, what we do, um, and then at the end of the conference, we'll tell you a little bit more um, about what our uh, yearly schedule looks like. So if you are an underclassman and you're interested in joining, um, we can give you some more information at the end. Um, but I'd first like to start with um, what exactly FYI is. Um, and... Um, I'll read you a little bit of, about the bylaws. Um, so our, the mission of FYI is empowering the voice and uniting the youth of Fargo through actions and teamwork. Um, our vision is an atmosphere where youth have a positive, sustainable impact on the community of Fargo. And the tagline is connect, create, educate, which you can see on our wonderful t-shirts. Um, we have uh, three specific functions. First, we serve as a liaison between the city of Fargo and the youth of Fargo. We investigate needs, problems, and issues affecting the youth of Fargo, and we research issues and make policy or project recommendations to the Fargo City Commission. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Tate, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what Impact Fargo is um, and the history of Impact. All right, so obviously you're at Impact Fargo right now. This is our fourth annual one. It started in 2016 um, when we were freshmen, at least the seniors on FYI were freshmen. And for the past four years, it's kind of been like gaining more and more traction. It started out a really small venue in um, the Fargo Theater. And then gradually we made our way to here. Um, so Impact Fargo, while well, you're here, it's, um, it's a youth, fully youth-led conference um, with present oh my gosh, presentations um, from local leaders in Fargo. Um, an another aspect of it is obviously, if you check your name tags, you can see the star on the back of it. So these are going to be your groups for power half hours, which we'll find out more about later. But essentially, any recommendations that you have from us during this event will be directly presented to the city commission during their meetings. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why we do this, in order to get input from like, a good sample of high schoolers and being able to present that directly to local government and hopefully make some change. Um, this year's theme is the future of Fargo, which is, you know, we're young, and so obviously we're going to be coming the future of Fargo, as well as seeing what you want the future of Fargo to be, to like how do you want, you know, other young people 10 years in advance to experience Fargo, how they want them to think about Fargo. And so that's kind of what we were thinking of when we were thinking of the theme for this event. Um, yeah, and I'll 
bring it, talk about art a little bit? Yeah, I can, I can yeah. you got that. Um, so a big component of today's conference is um, art and student art. And a lot of our speakers will be touching on their experiences with art in Fargo um, and what youth can do to share their art. Um, but I'd like to uh, kind of talk about a little bit about the venue that we're in. As Mayor Mahoney said, we have these wonderful panels, um, but there's art or, all around the city, um, the city hall. As you were walking in, there were those um, big colorful panels. And those are actually from a young local artist, Katie Miller. Um, and they're designed around the theme of past, present, and the future of Fargo. So that kind of ties into our theme, the future of Fargo. Um, so make sure to take a look at those as you're leaving um, and look around at the art around City Hall. Um, we have a lot of great talent in Fargo. I know, I know we have a lot of great talent in this audience as well. Um, so we'd like to bring your attention to that throughout this conference. Um, that's really a big important part of Impact Fargo 2019. Um, and with that, I'll hand um, the microphone over to Hadley who will tell you a little bit more about social media. All right, so we have a hashtag. Um, it is on your name tag, so if you forget it. Um, it's Impact Fargo 2019, and there are balloons you can take pictures with, and um, you can follow us on Instagram at Fargo Youth Initiative, or on Twitter, Impact underscore Fargo. Um, anyone who's wearing a FY t-shirt, you can go up and ask them about the schedule, or like, what, a, what are we having for lunch, which I think is Jimmy John's. So yeah, if you have any questions, just come up and talk to us. We're always going to help out, so that's... Um, I'm Olivia, and I just have a few logistics reminders. So your absences will be excused as long as you got a parent request, which you can still call or text your parents if you need to. And we'll do attendance checks throughout the day. If you're here the whole time, it'll be changed to an activity excused. Um, the schedule is posted on Instagram if you'd like to look at it. And as well, you can ask any of us if you have any questions about that. And just please be respectful of the space. Throw your garbage away. We're in City Hall, so... Now, Hadley, Chloe, and Andy are going to tell you a little bit more about who we are. So we're a fun, kooky group of kids, and just like you guys. <laughs> so um, we're just going to do some, <clears throat> we have pictures and grades and fun facts. So we'll just pass down the microphone and say these people. So this is Martha Denton. She's a co-chair. Um, she's a senior from Fargo North, and fun fact, she has a complete set of vegetable-themed stocks. We love that. This is Tate Fisher. He's the co-chair of uh, the FYI board. Um, he is a senior at Fargo North, and fun fact, he fell down a flight of stairs when he was five. Nice. All right, this is Ed Shen. He's from Fargo Davies. He's a senior. And a fun fact, Ed was a child voice actor in China. <clears throat> this is Hadley Minier. Minier? Minier. Minier. Ooh. She is a junior at Fargo North. And Hadley would love nothing more than a pet raccoon. <laughs> this is Olivia Drake. She is a sophomore from Davies. And she can't blow a bubble with bubble gum or whistle. So that's fun. This is Erica Spanger. She is a speaking chair at FYI. She is a freshman at Fargo North, and she has the cutting skills of a first grader. This is Morgan Mastrude. She's a senior at Fargo North, and Morgan once swam with a wild manatee in Belize. Yeah. This is Andy Tao. <laughs> He's a freshman from Davies, and he is great at cooking and dancing. This is Chloe Bry. She is a junior at Fargo South. Chloe has an extreme hitchhiker thumbs. This is Yovana Marshall. She's a sophomore at Fargo South. And Yovana doesn't have cartilage in either of her ankles. I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's us. Um, yeah, just feel free to talk to us if you want. Um, thank you and enjoy our feature presentation. I think that goes there. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker will be Chelsea Ewan. All right, and Chelsea Ewan is the communications coordinator at the Arts Partnership. She creates content hi highlighting partners from the Fargo Forum, KFGO, the blog, their weekly 
e-newsletter connecting the dots, and social media platforms. In 2018, she won the Woman of the Year in the Arts and Culture category from the YWCA. In her free time, she enjoys watching movies, collage collaging, playing board games, thrifting, traveling, and attending art events. She lives in a teeny apartment in down, downtown Fargo with her husband, Mike, and her many plants. Please help me in welcoming. Good morning, everyone. What a great start to the week. It's Monday, and we have new energy. It's a new week. Let's liven up a little bit, right? Um, yes, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to the Fargo Youth Initiative for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, I, I was happy to be involved with the event this year because, as you know, the theme is Future of Fargo, and the arts play a major role in the development of our beautiful city, so I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I will today kind of talk about what the Arts Partnership is and my role um, in that and a little bit about myself. And then I'll talk a little bit about how you, as this next generation, the future of the arts, um, can get more involved in the community if you are interested in that, which it, I, I mean, the theme today is art, so I'm assuming that a lot of you are interested in that, which is great. So the, I, I guess it says it up there, but has anybody, if you raise your hand, who's heard of the Arts Partnership? Okay. Awesome, great. There's a good number of you that haven't, so I'm glad I'm here today so I can inform you a little bit about it. Um, so we are the nonprofit umbrella arts organization in, based in Fargo, but we work with local arts organizations and artists all throughout the metro area. So Fargo, West Fargo, and uh, Moorhead. And our mission is to cultivate the arts in our community. And we do that in a lot of different ways that may sound a little vague. It's like cultivate the arts in the community. OK, the, doing what? I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we were founded in uh, 1970. So we're going to be celebrating our 50 year anniversary next year, which is very excited, exciting. Um, but we were started as the Lake Agassi Arts Council in uh, 1970. And we changed our name to the Arts Partnership in 2009. Um, our, three, our three core values are to support local art and the artists who make it to advocate the arts role in a vibrant economy, and to promote a creatively enriched community. So everything we do at the Arts Partnership follows our mission and also falls into one of those three buckets, our core values. Those are what drive us in our decision making, in how we develop as an organization, and um, that just really goes to show of what we value. So you can go to the next slide, perfect. Um, we live our mission and values by communicating about the arts. And uh, as mentioned in my introduction, I am the communications coordinator. So most of that falls to me, but my boss and our president and CEO, Dana Del Valls, does a lot of communicating as well. We advocate for the arts, we provide networking opportunities to local artists, and we give grants to artists and arts organizations, making our community a vibrant place to live. We also give grants to other nonprofits who are doing arts-related type of programming in their organization. So all of our grants are uh, funded by the city of Fargo, the city of Moorhead, and the city of West Fargo. Uh, we give that money from the cities, and that gets re-granted out to those organizations. So when we receive that money from the cities, we uh, then give those to artists and arts organizations who apply for them based on they may need general operating support or they may be applying for something specific like a project support grant and those actually are due at the end of this week. So a lot of we're getting a lot of those applications in for the next year of, of grantees, which is very exciting. And then we, um, we announced those grantees at our State of the Arts event in June. You can go to the next slide. This is our team. So in the middle there is Dana Del Val. She is our president and CEO of the organization. Uh, she is really the person that's steering this organization and really making us think very big, very broad. How are we, how are we developing? What's our plan for the next years, th these years to come? How are we going to continue co to grow? How are we going to continue to encourage people to think of the arts not just as fluff, because they're not. They are integral to the, uh, to the well-being, both social and economic well-being of our city. So she is really steering that and meeting with leaders and organizations and the, go the governors and the uh, local government to really advocate for the arts role in, in our community, which is very vital. 
And then we have Tanya Blanich, who is our Director of Operations. She's the more internal operations of everything, and then she also operates our grants and um, programs, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But she's really the one that kind of keeps us afloat and all the, the inside work of uh, running the organization. And then there's myself as the communications coordinator. I communicate about the arts in a lot of different ways, which I'll talk about on a separate slide, but I have been communications coordinator since October 2016, and most of my communications tends to deal with the external. I'm mostly uh, communicating to the general public, but I also am responsible for um, maintaining relationships with um, other leaders in the community, um, and also with our partner organizations, which, um, they, they're the ones who I'm communicating about, so I have to, to know about them, right? And maintain those relationships. And then we also have Christina Johnson she and Danica McDonald. Both of them are part-time um, workers with us. Uh, Christina is the project manager. She's kind of a renaissance woman, which we love, because she can fix a sink and um, run our programs. And she really, has a really good eye, so she helps in curating some art pieces and things like that. We, we adore having her, because she's, she's very useful in a lot of ways and has a lot of skills. And then Danica McDonald is an, a student from NDSU. She started as an intern with us. Uh, uh, last summer, I believe, and now she's an, an executive assistant primarily working with um, Dana and Tanya, but she does some work for me as well, um, and she does kind of also what we, what we kind of pass on to her to, for, for all of us to keep the organization flowing as smoothly as possible. Like I mentioned, um, we are an arts partnership, so we have partners that we work with. Um, our, right now, we have over 140 local artists and arts organizations under our umbrella, and those are from all over the metro area. We work with individual artists of all media, so um, painters, ceramicists, musicians, printmakers, filmmakers, photographers, glass artists, metal workers, I mean, any kind of medium that you can think of, uh, it, we work with that, it, with individual artists that work in that medium. It's pretty cool that we have such a variety of local artists that work, and they do such amazing things. And I really enjoy uh, getting to know them and communicating about them. We also work with um, uh, all of the, most of the arts organizations in the community. So the theaters, the FMCT, Theater B, um, museums, Plains Art Museum, Rourke, Rourke Art Museum, galleries, the symphony, the ballet. Who knew that we had a ballet in the community? Okay. Who knows that we have a professional ballet say, and professional symphony? Yes. Okay. We have a professional opera. Raise your hand if you know about that. Okay, see, we, we are very fortunate to live in a community where we have these professional arts organizations that have arguably about as high quality productions as really, really big cities. We are fortunate to have that. Um, and we also have, uh, we work with dance organizations, choirs, concert bands. I'm, every time I, I, I attend a partner event, I am blown away by the quality of the of productions and performances that these organizations are putting on. They, they are incredible. And I encourage you to seek out how you can participate in some of these events as well, because they, they're, they're really awesome. We also have, oh, back one, one more. We also have um, business partners that we work with in the community who um, understand the importance of the arts in our community and um, find ways to be involved with that. And those are all listed on our website if you'd like to see the full list of partners. And those, that's a dynamic list that's always changing. Um, all of them do pay a certain fee to be a, a partner with us, and that just depends on um, their level of income. So um, that's determined who is our partners with us. Okay, now you can go to the next slide. Perfect. Like I mentioned, we also have some of our own programming that we do. Um, so that makes communicating about who we are uh, sometimes a bit of a challenge because we're talking about other people, but we also have our own things that we're doing too, um, which is, like I said, always a fun challenge. The first program is our arts, Artworks program, which places art exhibits in maybe places that you maybe wouldn't think of seeing an art exhibit. So public places like businesses, offices, banks. Right now we have our Artworks program is at the airport. Zeman Guan's work is currently on display in the baggage claim area of the airport. If you are traveling anytime soon, I highly recommend that you check that out. It's, it's beautiful. 
And it's more than just hanging art and then it stays there. This is meant to be like an exhibit where it's changing out. We're changing out the artwork probably every four months in each location, which is really cool. And I think right now we have about four, or no, excuse me, about 10 locations where the artworks program is and we hope to continue to grow that. Then some of you may have heard of Chalkfest before. That's one of our programs. It's the largest free art making event that we do every August. Uh, that started in 2013 and the first year we had it, it was at the um, Great um, Northern Bicycle Co. And we were expecting maybe 50 people. And so we were so surprised when about 400 people showed up to the event. It's just, it sounds just, you just come and you draw with, with chalk. It's amazing. Um, but that, uh, a fun fact about that, um, uh, as it relates to this event, is that that was started as one of your peers. Uh, we, um, we went to our intern at the time and said, hey, can you come up with a way to really engage your age group? We want to get to your age group. How do we do that? And she, uh, pro uh, she proposed this Chuck event uh, that she, I think she saw it in another uh, city. And she said, why don't we just get chalk and some pizza and just invite people to come to that. And it's grown so much. The next year we moved to Island Park and then we moved to Red River Zoo where it's, where it's been for the last three years. And of course, if you've been to the zoo, you know there's a lot of sidewalk space there and it's so much fun. I love that event every year. It's every August, it's usually very hot, but it's very good. Um, and then we have our community supported art program. Um, if you've ever heard of community supported agriculture programs, that with those programs, you buy a share and you get like a certain, um, you get like a basket of vegetables per month and you never really know what's gonna be in it, which makes it kind of fun, but you bought a share so you're able to get that. Well, this is kind of modeled like that, except instead of with vegetables, it's with art. So with our program, uh, we have 50 shares available every season and those shareholders get access to three different parties in May, July, and September. And at each party, they usually, they receive a culinary experience, so they get food uh, made by local chefs. That's not food that you find on any menu in the community. That's the, they make food specifically for this program. And then they also usually get a performance uh, from a local artist as well at the um, at these events and so we have culinary and performance and then they get visual art to take home at each from each party so you, at this share you get three pieces of art total uh, visual art which is very cool and we invite those artists to come and talk about their processes and it's just really fun it's 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 meant to be a party and to really um, bridge the gap between artists and other potential patrons uh, we've had uh, it's been a lot of artists that have participated in the program over the last eight years and that's their way of growing their audiences of people learning more about them in a more intimate way instead of just um, kind of more when you go to an exhibit and you see their work and then you meet them it's just a little bit more personal which is very cool and then app to creative incubator this is a temporary studio space which is right over there it's the single um, level brick building and app to creative incubator is owned by kilborn group but we operate the space right now there's about 25 artists uh, that have um, spaces in in apt and they range from jewelry makers to painters to printmakers to podcasters to musicians it's really cool excuse me it's really cool and we entered in that partnership with Kilborn group um, in 2016 and we understood at the time they said hey this is just a space that we're using and we want it's just kind of sitting there until we um, eventually raise it so are you interested in trying out um, having studio spaces in there and we said absolutely because that's something that is an abs absolute need in our community is not just that artists need studio space, they need affordable studio space. So that was something that we were really passionate about and um, in uh, our negotiations with Kilborn Group, they understood that as well. So that we started in 2016 and that is uh, now ending at the end of June. So we're still figuring out that next step, but it was kind of this grand experiment and we know that it's something that's needed in the community and the artists are excited and the rest of the community is excited to learn what that next step will be. 
And then lastly, I wanted to mention, this is something that has existed for a while, but because it's something that's especially useful for all of you, is the Metro Arts Pass. So this is something that you can check out at the library, and it gives you either discounts to local art events, or um, it gives you free tickets to them. So if you go to the library and type in Metro Arts Pass, you can see um, which organizations are participating in that. There's also a list on our website, too, if you look at programs and services, it's on the last tab. So I just wanted to mention that to you all since that's something that could definitely be useful for you. Next slide. And then we also have our Support Local Art campaign. You can see I'm wearing the t-shirt today. You may have seen these t-shirts around. This is a campaign that we started, I believe it was back in 2014. Um, and we love this campaign because it's evergreen. It applies no matter where you are. I've worn the shirt all over the world. And if I go to an art museum in that city, I'm supporting local art. So it's a, it's a concept that we love, and we have now have um, these really great Contigo mugs as well. You can buy those at Luna, or you can buy them from our office. Um, both t-shirts and mugs, I should say. Uh, the t-shirts are also for sale at Plains Art Museum, Unglued, and I think one other place. But we have a whole bunch of them at our office if you're interested in purchasing one. There's a, more information on our website for that as well. There's information on, for everything I'm talking about on our website, of course. That's what websites are for. But if you're interested in seeing that, that's on there. Okay, so I will now transition to myself. That's the Arts Partnership in a nutshell. Uh, we're, we do even more than what I have time to talk about today, but that's just the gist of what the Arts Partnership is. Before I move on to my role as communications coordinator, does anybody have any questions before I move on? I kind of talk fast and I have a lot of energy, so I understand if you may have one. Yeah, or yes. The website is theartspartnership.net, and I'll have that on my last slide, too. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on to my role as communications coordinator. So a little bit about me. I am originally from Minot, North Dakota, which is, of course, in the upper western part of the state. I was born and raised there, and I graduated from Minot High in 20, 2011, which was the same day, or excuse me, the same year as the flood that happened there. So I'm getting a little bit of flashbacks in, in the flooding that we have here. But um, I graduated in 20, 2011, and then I attended Minot State for one year, and I felt like I was sort of in this like in, in between phase in my life where I was in the town that I was still growing up in and I had classes with a bunch of people I already knew that I went to high school with and I just felt like I needed to challenge myself and get out of my hometown a little bit. So I transferred to NDSU in 2012 and that is where I graduated from with a Bachelor of Arts in, or excuse me, in Strategic Communications and International Studies. And uh, that's also where I met my husband. We had um, two classes together in our um, I, I met him probably like 10 days after I moved here. I was like, I'm just going to move, and I'm just going to leave it all behind, and I'm going to study abroad, and I'm going to do my thing, and not worry about meeting, you know, meeting a lover or anything like that. But I met him like 10 days later, and we got married in September 2017. So and he, was, um, he was a history and international studies major, so we studied abroad at the same time, which was really cute. He was in Spain, and I was in France, and we got to visit each other, and, you know, whatever. I know, thank you. Um, and so anyway, so I have a degree in strategic communications, international studies, and strategic communications is basically fancy wording for uh, a PR degree. What I do every day is public relations. That's, that's what I went to school for. That's where my skill sets are. Um, and I am really happy that I'm using my degree right out of college right now. I'm a communications coordinator. I'm doing PR for an arts organization. It's really fun. And then I, I interned at the Arts Partnership my last semester of college. It was something that was required to graduate. And so I reached out to Dana and said, hey, do you have internships available? And uh, they did. They had one open. And so I, um, I interned with them for a semester I, for about 120 hours. I was there for about 10 hours a week over four months. And I then left and um, was job searching right out of college, which is, is can be a little bit challenging. You will find that they, it, the job search can be just kind of stressful and knowing where to look and all of that. But my predecessor, Melissa Kosick, she's the she was the previous communications coordinator at the Arts Partnership. She got a job down in New Orleans, kind of 
uh, suddenly. And Dana reached out to me and says, hey, uh, can you come and just keep things afloat, basically do the newsletter, uh, do a few blogs a week, do our advertising stuff for us while we search for someone? And I said, of course, absolutely. And then they encouraged me to apply, which I was kind of shocked by, because when you read job, job descriptions, you can be a little discouraged and be like, oh, well, I don't have five years of experience, so I shouldn't even apply, right? But they, they encouraged me to, and then they hired me, which was the best thing. It was the day before my birthday, and it was a really great birthday gift. And uh, I started full-time in October 2016. So that's how long that I have been with the Arts Partnership. And since then, I, I have developed and grown so much over the last two years. I, um, you know, right when you get out of college, you're kind of in this phase where you're like, okay, I know a lot of things, but you still feel like you don't know anything. It's kind of like, okay, well, what do I do now? I, you, you, you've, you've been in school for 20 some years where people say, okay, here's the syllabus, here's what you do, these are your exact directions. When you start at a job, you do not have that. You're kind of sort of like, all right, figure it out, which I, it takes a little bit of time for about the first year that I was there, just kind of learning the position, really getting my name out there, really trying to get involved in the community. Um, but it, I have grown so much and I'm so thankful for this position because it's been really really fun and a really great experience right out of college so my job as communications coordinator is to amplify the work of our partner organizations under our umbrella uh, in a lot of different ways uh, traditional and digital and social media I basically do it all it's pretty cool so I have a weekly article in the Fargo Forum every Monday, which actually you can read my story today. It's about um, a local photographer named Dan Francis. He won fifth place in a worldwide photo competition, which is pretty cool. So I wrote up a story about it, and it's in the forum today if you'd like to read it. And we, um, that content partnership, depending on how many Mondays are in the month, I have stories on all of the Mondays, and then usually the last Monday is when Dana has a column. So she's writing for the forum as well. And you'll see that um, and that's just a way for her to be um, an advocate and it's a way for me to have a really visible platform to communicate about the arts in our community we're very grateful for that content partnership with the forum because that's not something that's very um, common I don't think which is very cool for us I also have a weekly radio show called The Metro Art Scene, naturally, um, on KFGO with Bob Harris. I go on the radio every Wednesday evening, usually, now that it's baseball season's kicking in, I, uh, I usually appear after that, um, after the Twins game, so usually about 8.30 or 9 p.m. every night, but then it's always podcasted, which is nice. Um, so I'm able to share that, but I go on the radio with Bob and we just talk about art events coming up in the community. It's pretty fun. And there's never, I'm never short on content because there's always something going on in the arts community. And I also operate our uh, public calendar on our website, which is basically meant to be a one-stop shop for um, knowing what's happening in the arts community. It's not exhaustive, of course, because not everyone's partners with us or maybe someone didn't notify me of it. but. That is a great place to start if you're looking for um, things happening in, in the local arts community. Uh, and funny enough, I actually use that calendar. I'm probably the one that looks at that calendar the most, to be honest, because that's what I use to plan my editorial content. I look at what events are coming up, and it's like, oh, that could be a fun forum story. Oh, that could be a fun blog, which I do about two blogs per week. I do a lot of writing, a lot, a lot of writing in my job, which I'm communications coordinator so of course that's the nature of it but um, and then all of that content is then in our weekly newsletter called connecting the dots it has to do with um, it's relate relates to our logo if you saw the logo at the beginning that's why we call it connecting the dots because that's really what we're doing we're we're connecting things in the community and that is delivered every Thursday afternoon and it's just once per week so it's we're not emailing you constantly so if you're interested in staying in touch with what's happening in the arts community every week that's a great way um, to do that you can subscribe to that and it's made by yours truly so it's extra supportive if you do that I, I want to know that people are reading what I'm putting out there it's nice and then I also operate our um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Um, Dana also um, posts on Facebook too, but Twitter and Instagram are just me. So that's just another way for us to be sharing our content and um, talking about what we're doing in the community. Right before I came up here, I was tweeting about this. I was going to post on Facebook, but then didn't have time, so I'll do that later. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, social media. And then I'm also responsible for talking about ourselves. Like I mentioned at the beginning, that's a common challenge for us is that I'm communicating about our other arts organizations, but I also need to communicate about us too so people understand what our role is. So we're not um, you know, falling through the cracks or not having as much visibility as we could. So that's something that I'm always kind of facing, um, but we are we, we try to be strategic in everything we do um, to, to alleviate that. And I think we have grown in our awareness a lot over the last few years, which is great. But there's always some raising awareness to do, like when I, you all raised your hands at the beginning of this, and most people hadn't heard of us. So that's, that's a lot of what I do. And actually later, I have another speaking event. I'm talking to the Lake Agassiz Exchange Club, um, which is a service club here in town. So I do uh, a lot of those as well, just to go and talk about what I do. It's it's, it's pretty fun. I enjoy it a lot. And then I also attend um, art events when I can too, to go um, and support our, our um, partners because we tell people, hey, support local art, but we should be practicing what we're teaching. <laughs> and we can't, it's, we, you know, it's like, oh, why aren't people participating in the arts? It's like, well, we also should be participating in the arts too. We're telling people to do it. We should actually go do it too. Okay. So why does this matter to you? You may be thinking, OK, yes, I get it. Wow, you can talk so much, and you have so much energy. Just like get to the point of why this matters to me. Um, you are the future of the arts. That's the theme of this, this program today. You are the future supporters, and likely current supporters too, of course. But as you move forward and you, um, as you grow, um, this is the arts in Fargo-Moorhead are always going to need support and advocacy. Every new generation, in order for that to grow, each generation needs to be aware of what's going on and why it's important. So they, this, the arts need your support and advocacy to really drive home to people who may not agree or really know that the arts are imperative to our social and economic well-being. Like I said at the beginning, they're not fluff. They are they are a major piece of what gives Fargo its identity, and it's a major piece of what um, attracts people to live here. It's what attracts people to work here, especially for people who, um, um, who may, aren't, aren't from North Dakota or aren't from Fargo, especially like Sanford or those other biz, big businesses. The workplace retention is a huge challenge right now. And that's why we're trying to really drive that home because we want to be in that conversation and be part of that, um, that conversation with those people and say, oh, we have a really robust arts community. You don't come and you're just sitting in your house watching Netflix all the time. You really, um, through the arts, can grow this sense of community and see all of this incredible talent we have here. But that, that needs to, in order to grow, every new generation needs to be aware of that. So that's really where all of you fall in with this. And a lot of you have probably been involved with theater, been in arts classes, been creative since you were young, because that's what humans do. We're creative people. That's, that's what sets our species apart from other species. That's how we've evolved. That's how we solve problems, is through our creativity. And regardless of how creative you are, everyone's creative. That's something that I believe. You may be like, oh, I'm not creative. You absolutely are. It's just that some people flex that muscle a little bit more than others. And so in being creative, you are really um, celebrating your humanity. I mean, that's, that's something that I just believe so much and can never stop talking about. It's, 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 it's something that needs to be dry, drove home really often. And how you can do that is start small. It's just start paying attention to what's happening in the arts in our community. Um, like I mentioned, a great way to do that is through our calendar, is through our, our newsletter. It doesn't have to be necessarily through us, but we're a great start because we're the umbrella arts organization. For the most part, we know what's going on in the community and we'll tell you about that or inform you of it. That's what we're here for. Um, and educate yourself on what's available for you to experience. Like we, I mentioned in the beginning, not a lot of you knew we have a professional opera or a professional symphony or other uh, professional theaters or professional um, ballet. That's something that a lot of people don't know. And so that's something that we run, want to continue to grow because these experiences are, um, I mean, 
the, like I said, the caliber is incredible. I cannot overstate that enough. So just be, just be aware of what's available for you to experience. You don't necessarily have to do it, but just know about it in case you know someone, a family member who wants to do something new or wants to try something, just, just be aware of it. And they, like I said, are what make Fargo-Moorhead an appealing place to live, work, and play. And that's why they have such an integral role in the, the past, present, and future of Fargo, but especially the future. If we want to continue to grow as a community, we're going to need to figure out how to make people want to live here. Because that's something that is a huge challenge, and the arts can be a huge role of that. And that they need your participation, your support, your advocacy to prove this as true. And as you go on, you may find, oh, all of these arts organizations also need board members. They need volunteers. They, just like any other nonprofits, there's ways for you to be involved. A lot of them maybe need assistance with communication or an intern. So just a great way to start is look at our partners list on our, on our website and see where your value alignment is. See what you're interested in and see how you can get involved with the local arts community. Um, I think that that is all I had for you. I, can you go to the next slide? Oh, there we go. How to get involved. Yes, attend local art events, stay up to date with our calendar, consider volunteering, use, use that Metro Arts Pass. That's a great way too to just, I understand that a lot of you may be on, uh, on a budget, um, and that's a, that's a great way to start because um, a lot of arts organizations also offer reduced rates for students. Usually, I know for a fact that the symphony always has student rush tickets for $5 an hour before each performance. That's a great way to start uh, and save some money. Um, and I think the opera and all the other big arts organizations have student rate tickets. So that's, that's just something to know is that I understand that a lot of you are probably on a budget. You can get these tickets for very reasonable rates. And participate, audition per performances, apply for opportunities on our Calls for Artists page. That's something that's open to everyone. We receive these calls if people are requesting um, proposals for something arts related, whether it's, hey, we want people to know about this poetry rock workshop. Hey, we're looking for artists um, to make this mural. Hey, we're looking for artists to feature in our space, whatever it is. When we receive it, we post that up there, and that's for that they have contact information, how to apply, all that information is there. What our role is, is just to inform you of it and know about it. And most of those opportunities are paid. That is something that we are very, um, we strongly believe is that artists deserve to be paid for the work because uh, exposure doesn't pay for rent or utilities or groceries. So, but, and even if it's not a lot, at least it's something you're being compensated for your work. So be aware of those if you are a maker in the community, pay attention to that Calls for Artists page. And do whatever makes you feel most creative. Like I said, creativity is what sets, sets us apart from the other species, and it's what makes us um, what, what provides us an opportunity to continue to grow and to um, you know, or maybe it's art as healing. Maybe you're using art to, um, maybe you're going through a tough time. Like art, art does more than just entertain us. It's, it's, it's just so much more than that. And I, I can't overstate that enough. Okay, I think that that was the last one. There we go. There's our website, theartspartnership.net. That's where you can see our calendar. That's where you can sign up for our newsletter, see what's going on in our community, learn more about our programs. Um, you can also connect with us on the, there's our social media handles. You can follow us on Facebook. Our Twitter handle is arts underscore tap. I tried to change that. It's like hard, our, our name's so long. I tried to make a more dynamic handle, but so far that's still what that is. It's arts underscore tap. And then Instagram is the arts partnership. We're also on LinkedIn too, but I'm still trying to figure out the company profile and what, how useful that is for our organization. So that exists if you want to follow us. But um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. This has been so much fun and I'm very excited to see you all around at art events. Hopefully you're there. I know for a fact that tomorrow, right off the top of my head, the FMVA has their big art show reception over at the Yomcom Center. That is free. And most of these um, receptions and things like that are free. And then there's free snacks, too. There's food there if you want that. Um, yes, thank you again so much for your time and attention. And is, are there any questions now that I'm done talking? <sighs> yes, hi. Hmm, great question. Um, a great way, uh, you can always apply for a partnership. 
Um, there are, I believe for students, it's $25 a year to be a partner with us. Uh, that would be a great way if you're an emerging artist to get involved. Um, but in terms of working with, we have some high schools that are partners with us as an overall general um, organization, but uh, if you're looking for individual opportunities, um, we're, we're, also, we're also a resource for people too. So if you're looking for just advice on how to move forward with things, like you can always reach out to us and say, hey, I'm thinking this. Uh, do you know of someone or some business or something that, that this is the idea I have and I want to try to make it happen? That's another thing that we are as a resource for people too. We are a li liaison between a lot of different things. Um, so that's also how I would encourage that. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you choose that path, if you decide to go to college, um, I, I wish I had been more aware of what was available to me in terms of experiences, but also networking is so huge. If you stay in Fargo, this is still um, kind of, this is still a small community in that a lot of people know each other. So networking and getting yourself out there is really important if you decide to stay here, but networking is important no matter where you go. If you end up leaving Fargo, I mean, you know, there's networking wherever you go. But I recommend being involved with, um, with organizations like, for example, I am a member with the Fargo Moorhead Professional Communicators, which is a great way for me to meet other communicators. Um, and I'm also with the American Advertising Federation. I'm a member with them that has events every month and the students can get involved in that too. Those are two communications-based um, organizations, but um, also YPN, Young, Professional, Run, Young Professionals Network through the chamber is also a great way to just start, start meeting people in the community because that, when you're out there and putting yourself out there, your face and your name is what comes to mind when people say, hey, I'm looking for this person or this position. Do you know of anybody? That you're, you're staying top of mind, top of their mind when you're out there putting yourself out there. And that's, that's something that I always tell people. Also be aware that you are never gonna stop learning. I mean, you'll, you'll graduate high school and then if you decide to take your next path, whether that's college or going maybe into an apprenticeship program, whatever it may be, you're not gonna know everything. You, you, I, I can't stress that enough. You're gonna always keep learning. I'm constantly taking workshops on social media because as you know, social media is constantly changing. I, it's like, oh, this feature is, I, this, I, okay, now I have to learn this. And I'm um, going to conferences and I'm, I'm trying to stay on top of my field and top of the knowledge because I want to be seen as an expert in my field. So in order to do that, I gotta be, teaching myself things and learning new things, listening to webinars. Um, you know, that, that's another thing that I always tell people is that you're always gonna keep learning, no matter what. You're lifelong, lifelong learners. And just be aware of that and accept that and that, that will really um, contribute to your growth because you'll know to be out there and to be doing that and you'll, be, you'll develop a lot faster. Yes. Hmm. Community of Fargo together. That's so great. Well, a, a lot of organizations, there's a lot of collaboration that happens in the arts. All of, we're, we're fortunate to be in a community where other arts organizations, for the most part, are very um, supportive of one another. They're trying to figure out, hey, how can we, how can we work together to do this? So sometimes people apply for project or for grants that um, are for both organizations. I'm trying to think of an example right now, and my brain is kind of having a Monday moment, but um, that's in terms of bringing Fargo together, that's what all of these organizations are trying to do anyway. Um, for the most part, most of our um, general operating support grantees are like the big arts organizations, like the museums, the theaters, the, um, the uh, performance-based organizations. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring Fargo together. They need to get people to come to their events though. That's, some, that's a challenge that they're always, always facing. They're like, we just need to get people, we need, to get, we need to get butts in the seats. Once we do that, people will see, oh, I understand, okay. So I, I, that's kind of where my mind goes with that answer is that they're all trying to do that in a way. You know, I know that that's really vague, but 
that that's that's what the goal is for all arts organizations because art is meant to be um, is to, meant to be experienced together. You know, arts for the most part is not really a solo thing. It's meant to be experienced all together. So that's kind of what they're doing. I hope that answers your question. Let me know if you want me to be more specific, and I can think of it. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what our, that's what our individual arts um, grants are for. So our grant programs, um, our individual artist grant programs are, um, are funded by private donations. So organizations, like I mentioned, um, grants for organizations are funded through the cities, but individual grants are funded by private donors. So we always um, start uh, receiving applications for individual artist grants Usually that opens in like July and then the deadline is sometime in the fall. But that's what those grants are for. Sometimes um, people are just applying, they're like, hey, I need a projector for this film project. We're like, okay, apply for it, tell your story, make it compelling. And then um, that, that's usually what those are for. Those range from $250 to $2,500. So depending on what your need is, if you make your argument compelling enough, um, the grant panel um, usually is receptive to that, but that program has gotten more uh, competitive. Last year we had oh, probably double the amount of applicants that we'd had before, but we still had the same amount of money. So it was really competitive. We're always trying to grow that, but that, I mean, people need to donate to it if they want to do that. So um, that's something that I'd recommend. In the fall, be on the lookout for those if you're an artist and you, you need some equipment that's a great way to, to get some grants. So that's what those are for. So some, um, we also um, get, we receive money, we work with Jade Presents. They're the ones that are, fund our um, grants for musicians. And I believe this year they gave out about $16,000, which was pretty incredible. A lot of bands apply for that, like the Naughties, if you've ever heard of the Naughties, they're a grantee of ours. They, they received a grant to create their first full album. And now they're starting to take off, which is super exciting to, that we've, are part of that. That's what that's what we're here for. So, be on the lookout for that. Any others? Am I okay? Okay on time? We good? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we participated in the Americans for the Arts is the national arts advocacy group, and about every five years they. Um, have all arts or um, arts councils do a survey <laughs> and of course as you know getting people to take surveys can be challenging but we participated in the arts and economic survey uh, number five in 2015 so we'll do another one next year <laughs> Tanya gets to, to manage that she's super bummed it can be a lot of work but um, but it's a great way to gather some numbers because that's what people want to know about and we participated in the in the survey in 2015 and of the nonprofits that we got to take the survey, or the, peop the attendees to these events, I should clarify, it's people in the community that take this. We found that in 2015, the arts contributed 41.6 million dollars to our economy in 2015, and we know that that number is higher because that's just the data of the people that took the survey. So if we get more responses, I think that that number would have been higher, because the, for the art, they, that survey considers, hey, you're attending this art event, how much did you spend on tickets? Did you go out for dinner before this? Are you staying in a hotel? All of these factors that are bringing in income for the community goes into this survey. So that's where that, those numbers come from, and um, that's our most recent data for that year. Um, and all of that, that entire study is on our website too, if you will go under our, um, I think, economic tab, under our advocacy tab, I think. Yeah, or maybe it's the impact tab. But it's on our website, you can read the full report. It's pretty astonishing at the number. We were blown away by that, $41.6 million. That's a lot of money coming in. And I think when I'm excited for us to take it again next year and see how much that has grown because our arts community continues to grow um, and people are participating more, but we, we want that to be even more. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. 
Great question. So we are funded, um, our three primary funders are the cities, the city of Fargo, the city of Moorhead, and the city of West Fargo. We also, just like other arts organizations in this community, we apply for grants too. Like for, we, um, we just applied for a grant from the North Dakota Council on the Arts, which is the State Arts Council. We also apply for grants from the Consensus Council um, and other entities that give grants to nonprofit organizations. We're also funded by private donations, right? We're just about to launch a spring campaign for fundraising. And um, th those um, dollars, we, or we get individual donations too. So it's a mixed bag of how we're funded. Um, we also have really robust relationships with a lot of businesses in town. Um, they may sponsor events that we do or sponsor other program that we, uh, other programming we do. Um, just that sometimes that's um, events based or so on. In the past, Gate City Bank has sponsored Chalk Fest, Bell Bank sponsors State of the Arts, stuff, things like that. So there are a lot of um, businesses in the community that give money to us, even, even if it's an in-kind donation. Office sign companies and other a great, organ a great example of a business that we have a really good relationship with that does a lot for us. And there's a lot more, but it comes from a lot of different places, which is pretty common for a nonprofit. Usually it's mixed bag, so yeah. Mm, that's great. If there are businesses interested, we'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, a great way, we have a tab on our website that says for businesses and it takes you to a business page uh are, if people are it just kind of depends on what they're looking for uh a great way for businesses to get involved is through our artworks program that's a concrete example but if they just want to support us they should get in touch with dana because she's she's that primary person that people are meeting with to um about business sponsorships we are always looking for that so if you know of any please get in contact with us we'd love to have that discussion any other questions? All right, thank you so much. This has been a, such a great start to my week. I appreciate your time and attention. And I, like I said, hope to see you out at some art events. Support local art. <laughs> thank you. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna have a 15 minute snack break, so go enjoy.